Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The pandemic has taught us that national solutions to global problems do not work. We come to Glasgow with global ambition to save our people and to save our planet. But we now find three gaps on mitigation, climate pledges or NDCs. Without more, we will leave the world on a pathway to 2.7 degrees, and with more, we are still likely to get to 2 degrees. These commitments made by some are based on technologies yet to be developed, and this is at best reckless and at worst dangerous. On finance, we are $20 billion short of the 100 billion, and this commitment, even then, might only be met in 2023. On adaptation, adaptation finance remains only at 25%, not the 50-50 split that was promised nor needed given the warming that is already taking place on this earth. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. What is absolutely clear from the maths and the science, regardless of our political position, is that we have no hope of holding to 1.5 or even 2 degrees centigrade of warming unless we address the really thorny, difficult issue of equity head on. Now, what do I mean here by equity? Well, most of the emissions, over half of the emissions, come from just 10% of the global population. And a large proportion of those, of course, are in the wealthy parts of the world. But let's also not shy away from the fact that some of the poorer parts of the world, particularly some of the transition economies, the very wealthy people in those societies are also incredibly high emitters. So equity between nations is absolutely key. And that means that the wealthy nations that have prospered on the back of fossil fuels and have actually been the primary reason why we are now facing the challenges that we face on climate change, that these nations have to rapidly move away from fossil fuels ahead of the poorer nations. But that in itself will not be enough. They also need to provide significant financial um, transfer, reparation as I call it, is not aid, it's what we owe the poorer parts of the world, to one, help deal with the impacts that we have knowingly chosen to impose upon them, but also so that they can leapfrog over the fossil fuel era to have a very clean, zero carbon sustainable energy system. Unlike what we have here in the, in the global north where we still have a, a very fossil fuel rich energy system. But the equity lens needs to go or needs to be focused in even further because even within countries we see deep inequity. If you take a country like the US, the UK, much of continental Europe, Australia, many parts of the world, they're the high emitting countries. Within those countries themselves, the emissions are driven, come from the lifestyles of the relatively wealthy. So even within countries, we have to say, well, it's not that everyone is an equal part of this. The emissions need to be driven out of the relatively wealthy in our society. And who are the relatively wealthy in our society? They're the climate professors, they're the journalists, the legal people, the entrepreneurs, the policymakers, all the people that frame the climate debate are in the high emitting category, which is one of the reasons why we almost never hear about equity within countries. We barely hear about equity between countries. Issues of fairness and issues of responsibility are really key. We're not all in this together. Relatively small groups of people are responsible for most of the emissions and are also both geographically um, and financially insulated from the, from the early impacts of climate change. Eventually, climate change will impact on us all. But that particular group, is, uh, of which, of course, I am part, that particular group hopes to both be able to um, put in place things to protect us from climate change and not actually change our behaviours and our lifestyles. We like how things have turned out for us, and we are reluctant to recognise that we and our lifestyles and our norms 
are now the problem that needs to be addressed. We hear about this hundred billion dollars per annum that the rich countries should be giving to the poorer countries. Now, the first thing to realize that hundred billion is a small crumb that has fallen from the table where the feast is going on of the, of the wealthy countries. And the real skill of the wealthy countries, of course, is to get to people to argue about the crumb. The hundred billion is irrelevant. It is just a crumb. The real issue we need to be arguing about is who is feasting at the table and how do we more fairly um, spread out that bounty that we have on the table? And that's the question that we need to be asking. And we've been distracted by this 100 billion. We're talking about moving trillions of dollars from the wealthy parts of the world to the poorer parts of the world. And I think it is again key here that the wealthy countries will not engage in this of their own volition. They will need to be dragged kicking and screaming. So the poorer parts of the world need to be putting significant pressure on the wealthy parts of the world to uh, really address the equity issue. But also within the wealthy parts of the world, those people who are deeply concerned about climate change need to also recognise how key equity is to addressing these issues and should be pushing our own government to do far more than the lip service that they have offered so far. And this is true not just in the US, this is true across the EU who's doing very little on this, the UK that pretty much ignores these equity issues. So there, there are no progressive, so-called progressive countries that are showing leadership either on climate change in terms of technologies or in terms of this, this equity debate. So the other key issue on equity is to think about it within our countries. And what you often hear is that policymakers or business leaders or even academics, those of us who are in the high emitting group, will say, oh, we can never sell that in our country. You know, people, people won't accept it. Well, who are these people? If we are to solve climate change, then what we're talking about are putting in place technologies that are going to improve the quality of our houses. So to retrofit, to make suitable for the 21st century for heating and for cooling, our current houses. So that's a lot of engineering work, a lot of jobs. We're gonna to have to put in place public transport. We're gonna to have to electrify a lot of our industry and our transport network. So what we're talking about is a whole sort of physical infrastructure that needs to be transitioned to become zero carbon. Now that's a great jobs opportunity. Secure, long lasting, high quality jobs. Now for most people in our society, they would see that as a, as a positive thing. And the, what goes along with that is an improvement in their air quality in the cities. Who lives in the cities? The average consumer or below average consumer. Um, it's an improvement in our public transport. It makes um, having living in warmer houses or cooler houses, it makes it more affordable. It's win, win, win for that particular group. And that particular group, of course, is more than half of our population. The problem, is that who are the ones that have got to make the changes? Well, they are the high emitters in our society. As I said before, they're the, they're the academics, they're the barristers, they're the entrepreneurs, they're the policymakers, they're the journalists. And that particular group, the last thing that they want is to make changes to their lifestyles. So within a society, within a country like the UK, for example, but this is true for most industrial countries, 
it is not one story. The story there really is at least two, that the wealth in our society will have to make rapid, and, and they won't make it voluntarily. We need regulations that drive rapid social change in, in our lifestyles and our norms. What would the changes look like in a relatively wealthy country if we were to make our fair contribution to staying within 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming? Well, just to give a flavor of it, what we're talking about is really being zero carbon by about 2035 for the wealthy parts of the world. And I say the poor parts of the world get a little bit longer. 2035, at the most sort of 13, 14, 15 years from now. And now that's a very short period of time. And so what that's going to mean is that a lot of the things that, um, that, again, that this wealthy, say, one third of our society has normalised will have to change. The size of our houses. We shouldn't be building really huge houses anymore. I would also go further and say if we are really serious about climate change, we need to think about the very large properties that we have, which there are many of in our society, that need to be divided to make good quality and reasonable sized houses for say three or four families rather than just one family. No more second homes and where second homes are in areas where other people need to live they are no longer allowed to exist so no more second homes, no more business or first-class flights, far fewer flights and again let's think about that that sounds terrible if you look at somewhere like the UK 75% of all our flights are made by just 15% of the population and we know who that 15% are you know, they're not the average person or the poor person. So we're not talking about someone who flies occasionally away on holiday. We're talking about people who fly really regularly. They have their second homes, they have their big mansions, they have their large cars. And this particular group, all of those things will have to change significantly. What a lot of people say, well, that's not possible, that's a revolution. Well, I'm sorry, we've left it so late. So whichever way you go, it's a revolution. There isn't, there isn't a, a neat evolutionary way, incremental step-by-step -step way out of this in any direction. Being impacted by two, three, four degrees centigrade of climate warming will be utter devastating for many people in society, for most of us, all of us in society, at those sorts of temperatures. So the responses that we have then will have to be revolutionary and they'll be revolutionary, chaotic, uncontrolled and full of suffering. The revolution I'm talking about is one that will be very challenging still, but is one that we have some control over. It's one that we can come out of the other side with a much, you know, a much more prosperous, sustainable future for us, our children and for living in harmony with the other you know, more than human species around the planet. And so there isn't a non-radical way out of this. There would have been if we started in 1990, we chose not to. We chose not to in 2000, we chose not to in 2010, we chose not to in 2020, and we are now reaping the repercussions of not driving action over 30 years. So radical change is inevitable now, whichever way we go. And I think to choose radical change that is um, 
at least in some way organized and structured and involves much less suffering is, is far more preferable than you know, leaving the climate to, to, to run havoc around the planet with all the suffering and ecological collapse that that will create.